But I want to um, apologize. Um, I was at our, we're under lockdown in our city and I had a last um, family dinner. So I tried to get home as soon as possible, but I'm sorry, I'm very late. Um, but anyways, let's get started. So Monica, can you share screen or yeah, should yeah. I share screen? I can I'm, give you, sorry. I should be able to get you, give you the ability to okay. be like the host and then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Where's your name? Okay, I'll just do this. Make host. All right, you're host now. Okay, I'm the host now. So I should be able to share screen. Share screen, 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 share. Can you make sure you're recording it as well? Oh, yes. Can you not record it? Or no, the host you... is the one who can record it. Press oh. record and then go record on cloud. It still says record. It's still saying record? Okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's right. You, you are recording. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen, everybody? Yep. There we go. Yes. Yay. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, just want to put a plug in here for Unschooling Canada. I know we have probably a few people here from around the world. And um, we do have a lot of information at Unschooling Canada because we're a nonprofit group. Um, so my name is Judy Arnau. I don't know, Monica probably gave a thingy of me, but <laughs> I um, I actually teach about child and brain development for several health organizations and the U of C. And um, I am a non-punitive parenting proponent. I um, teach about no punishment parenting ever. I've done no, pu no punishment parenting with my five kids and I'm an extreme advocate. So, um, okay. I have to admit people to the waiting room. <laughs> Anyways, um, I've written some books on non punitive parenting and they're out there. So. <clears throat> now, my latest book is called Unschooling to University. So what happened was I unschooled my five kids and um, we had a lot of unschooling friends. So when they reached the age of 17, 18, and some of their school friends, some of their unschooling friends, homeschooling friends were going off to post-secondaries, my kids were too. And I thought, well, well, I can count 30 people in my circle of who has kids going off to post-secondary and university through unschooling. And I thought, I have to write a book about this because this information needs to get out there. People need to know that you don't have to go to school. You don't have to go to high school. You don't need a diploma to go on to post-secondary, whether that's universities, colleges, arts, tech schools, whatever your child wants to go to. So most of the information I'm presenting tonight is from chapter 20 and 21 of the book I wrote, Unschooling to University. Um, and this is kind of, yeah, so the high school years, the post-secondary years, in those chapters, I talk about what's happening in the brain, how kids tend to get more self-motivated, how to um, jump through hoops they don't want to jump through when they were younger, but to get on their way to go onward and get on with their um, career preparation. So I had five kids. I have um, four of those five kids were accepted to universities and three of them were in STEM careers, which is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, so, so far, three of them have graduated university. Um, one is currently in their third year and I have one who is a master's student this fall. And they have applied to 10 Canadian universities, 12 Canadian universities. Um, all within the McLean school rankings. So this is kind of geared to Canadian. Things happen differently in the US because tuition is a lot more expensive in the USA. 
and money can buy you a place in. In Canada, relatively speaking, our tuition costs are very low. You'll pay something or your child will pay something like $2,500 to go to the maritime universities and maybe 6,000 to go to BC, Alberta. But relatively speaking, you look at other countries and it's about $15,000 a year. So Canada is not so much based on how much money you have, but um, credentials of getting in. So in the book, I followed 30 of our friends. They all got into um, universities and they 10 were in STEM. We had four engineers, 10 were in humanities and 10 were in the arts. So you can um, see their profiles in the book. I also have a blog. If you liked what you heard tonight, feel free to join us. My blog is not so much what's in the book, but other things I want to talk about <laughs> related to university. Okay, so um, I want to just focus a little bit about the brain. So this graph here is from the brain story by the Palix Foundation. And it shows you the development of the prefrontal cortex. It's, you know, the brain develops from the back to the front. That frontal part where um, kids develop self-control. And you can see um, about age 17 is when they take that final leap of self-control. That it's the best they're ever going to be. And that corresponds with anecdotal evidence that kids that age start thinking, hmm, what do I want to do with my future? Am I willing to put in some effort to get there? And for the most part, a lot of kids are, but a lot of kids don't reach that stage till, as you can see, 25 and even later. So even at age, let's say 50, um, right here, <laughs> they're still on that plateau of self-control as they were at, at 16. So if they want to go back to university or start a career at age 40, 50, it's never, ever, ever too late to start. And we know that because you look at the makeup of universities and post-secondaries, and there's a lot of adult students there. And they bring with them a richness of life experience. So if your 17, 18-year-old has no plans to go on to post-secondary, it doesn't mean that that door is shut forever. Okay. okay, so just a quickie thing of what unschooling is for those who are curious and just popped in here thinking, hmm, <laughs> what is unschooling? Um, basically, all children are self-directed learners from birth to age onward. They all play. Um, play is a primary learning vehicle for children. And at age five, six, we often say to kids, you can't play anymore. You have to go to this place called school. And you can't learn what you wanna learn through play. You have to go to school and the government tells you what to learn. So that's what kids do. And then, but unschoolers just keep on playing. They're that red line there that keep on playing and keep on learning. And they learn everything school kids learn, but through a different format. And then I said, like around age 17, they may decide, hmm, I need a bit more credentials to go on to where I want to go in post-secondary. Maybe I will go to school and maybe I'll just keep self-teaching myself to get those credentials. So that's what unschooling is. Now, when I present this out in the public, <laughs> I ask people, okay, let's say your 17-year-old has just come up from the basement playing four months of Fortnite, and they want to go into a career. So I say, okay, what's a career? Name a career. And when I present this, I always get people saying, doctor. So let's go with that. So let's go. Your 17-year-old comes up from the basement and says, I want to be a doctor. What do you do? <laughs> okay, so a doctor has a medical degree and they need a um, bachelor's degree before they go into applied to medicine. So a science degree is probably a natural thing. Although nowadays they're accepting a lot of different degrees, arts degrees, humanity degrees, they want a well-rounded doctor person. So if your child is motivated 
they need about nine courses of prep to have credentials for their first degree, okay? So this is Alberta. In Alberta, only some of these courses need a prerequisite. So they can, at age 18, they can just take English 30. They could either read the, the study book and write the exam and same with social. So for a doctor, they would need nine of these courses. They need English grade 12, social grade 12, chemistry grade 11, grade 12, physics grade 11, grade 12, biology grade 12, and math, which I would suggest do the high school math and do grade eight math as a way to introduce yourself, your child to formal math on paper concepts. You can skip grade nine. So that's for a science degree, <coughs> excuse me. For engineering, say they wanna be an engineer, all they need is English 30, um, social 30, dash one or dash two, <coughs> excuse me, chemistry, two courses, physics, two courses, they don't need biology. Um, they need math, definitely math. And again, that's four courses there because they build. And then math 31, they could take at the university. They don't need to have that in order to apply for engineering. So if your child is really, that's what they wanna do. If they wanna be a doctor or they wanna be an engineer, they need two years of preparation. They do not need to go back to grade one <laughs> and start all the way from grade one to grade 10. Absolutely not. They just need these certain high school courses or the credentials for the courses to apply and move on, okay? Um, by the way, uh, write your questions down. I will be happy to answer them. This is gonna not take more than about 20 minutes. <clears throat> so we have to acknowledge that people learn in much different ways these days. It's a school is one way to learn, but kids learn through a lot more things, people, experiences, this was the Alberta Education Symposium of Inspiring Education in 2009. And this was comprised teachers, principals, <clears throat> corporate leaders, academia, and they all decided that kids, one way to learn is through school, but they also learn in many other ways. <clears throat> so we're fortunate, we have a lot of textbooks out there and pretty well, biology is biology, whether it's in Germany, in India, in South Africa, in the US, biology is biology. Chemistry is chemistry, math is math. Um, <clears throat> and any child can get a biology textbook from the library. If they're keenly interested, they can learn it. They can do some self-study questions and they can prep for an exam that certifies their qualifications in biology. Same with chemistry, same with math. <clears throat> so <clears throat> my kids did that. Um, we did a self-directed high school. So my kids in Alberta would be able to um, self-study through textbooks, through Khan Academy, through tutors. We didn't hire too many tutors. They were expensive. Um, <laughs> through however way they could get their answers met and get their knowledge. And um, we presented their work to school authorities that we had to register under home education. And we would give the mark and the school authorities would confer the mark and say, yeah, it looks like you, you did well. But the big um, universal level playing field in Alberta is the diploma exam. So my kids wrote the diploma exams. They wrote 21 diploma exams for kids. They got an average of 78% by doing self-directed courses. And a lot of those were not teacher taught, they were self-taught, right? The provincial average in Alberta is 65%. So obviously they, they, their average was about the same as the number one private school in Alberta for that year. So kids do not need 16 years of education, preschool and grades one to 12 to learn, absolutely. What they need is more play 
and to discover their interests and what they want to do for their, for the next five years. And kids these days don't prepare for one career for the rest of their life. We know that. Um, when I went to university, universities have these parent orientations now, which is really great, right? Parents show up for prenatal classes and university orientations. And nothing in between. But what... Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> at this university orientation, there were 400 parents in the audience and the speaker said, okay, parents, how many of you are in the career now that you're working in of what you trained for, of what you started out with at your, your adult years. And only four parents out of about 400 put their hands up and said, yeah, I'm working in the same career. So kids, adults, um, everybody needs a five-year plan, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be stuck in the same career for the rest of your life. The average is four to five different careers. Okay, so let's look at 14 ways to get into post-secondary universities. <clears throat> now, these are the homeschooling options in Alberta. You can either go the home education route or you can go school. Um, every child can decide at the end of grade nine, they go in home ed or they go in school. If they do the school route, they meet the course outcomes and they get 100 credits and they graduate with a diploma. If they decide to go home education, they can do the same thing. Now, they have to transfer. At this point, they can't keep getting course credits for the 22 solo outcomes. Let's be clear, that's not going to cut it for high school. The government doesn't care about any marks from grades one to nine, but they do care about grades 10 to 12. So if your child is gonna get credits for high school courses, they do have to meet the Alberta programs of study for those courses. <clears throat> but having said that, it's a lot less work meeting those outcomes under home education than it is under school because you know your child best, whether you're the teacher or your child's a teacher, you, they know how they learn, they know how they can study, they know best of what works for them and they can customize those Alberta programs of study to meet their needs. For example, in school, if your child's taking English 30-1, they're gonna have to probably do Hamlet, probably do King Lear, um, probably have to do streetcar named desire and they have no choice about that but if they're doing english 30-1 under home education they can study the matrix they can study um whichever novel they want something that is more um conducive to their interests so it's a lot more flexible under home ed and Children can still, if they don't have any desire to get credentials for post-secondary, they can still keep on going under those 22 solo outcomes and not worry about um, credentials at all. They won't get a diploma, they won't get course credits, but they'll just be done with schooling or home education. Now, every university does not require a high school diploma. No diploma. Let's. <laughs> I checked all the major universities across Canada Waterloo, McGill, UBC, Alberta, <clears throat> Memorial do not require a high school diploma. High school diplomas are for the governments to measure how many kids have went through their 12 years of courses. But you, the kids do not need that. What they need depending on the program is five grade 12 subjects, usually a math course, an English course, a science course, a social studies course, and an option. <clears throat> That's all they need. They need to present 
marks in those courses. However they get those marks is what they need. So here across Alberta is the provinces, the English course equivalents here, math, social studies, biology, chemistry, physics, and languages. So whatever province they're in, they're probably gonna need that course equivalent of five of those core courses and options to get into post-secondary. <clears throat> Now, Alberta has diploma exams. BC has grade 11 exams, I believe. And not many other provinces have leaving school exams. And what that means is that there's quite a variation of who's applying to different institutions across Canada. This is this year's McLean's um, competitive entrance average. So what that is, is post-secondaries, they look at the candidates that are applying this year. They open applications on October 1st. They get them all the way to August 20th. <laughs> but pretty well, by about December, they know the quality of the competitive average of who's applying that year. So let's say in a year with COVID, where there's no diploma exams, the marks are going to be higher, much higher. So a lot more people are going to be applying for highly competitive programs, and it's going to raise the mark. So it's going to be, if your child doesn't have that competitive mark in their five subjects, it's going to be a lot harder to get into those competitive programs because they only have a certain number of seats. If for example, they want to go to the University of Calgary engineering program. There, there's probably about 240 seats that the university has to dole out to um, just 18 year olds from high school, mature students, international students, um, special students with special needs or special qualifying factors. So they have to dole out those 240 seats and based on that allotment of seats, that's where they place their competitive average cutoff. So anybody under that average, they're out of there. Anybody over are fighting for those seats. Not all um, programs in university are competitive. There's a lot of, you could get into arts, um, philosophy, humanities with a 70, mid 70s average too, right? So the competitive programs tend to be in the STEM programs just because there's a lot of jobs and they're well-paying jobs in those areas. But if your child wants to be a philosopher, they can pretty well pick their place. Okay, did I not put that X? Oh, same slide, okay. Right, number one, they parent issued transcript. So <laughs> you can, um, put together a transcript for your child. A lot of um, <clears throat> organizations will help you do this. And you just put your course on there like biology grade 12, English grade 12, write down what your child's done under those courses, dates, and then maybe put together a portfolio of what samples of work they did in those courses. And for many colleges, that works. They um, interview the child. They want to see what the child's like, how motivated they are, and they want to look at this parent-issued transcript. You could call it the Arnell Academy of Homeschooling, and they will accept that. I'd have to say, honestly, the major universities across Canada will not accept um, they want government issued transcripts that do not follow through the hands of students or families. They want them issued directly from the government. That's kind of the way it is. <laughs> it's sad, but it's the way it is. So, but for if your child's going to um, a college or um, an art school or tech school that is, you know, would, would look at portfolios that would be one way to go is to issue a parent transcript. Um, in the book, Unschooling to University, I have a whole 
um, section on what to include in those transcripts, what should your child should be able to know and prove that they have those qualifications. So this is what a government issued transcript looks like in Alberta. So this only lists the dates the course was taken, what semester, who the school was that reported it. So as you can see, there's a lot of school codes here. Most kids who go to high school only have one school code, but because we homeschoolers change boards every year <laughs> and those boards report certain courses or they take another course over the next year with a new board, it has a lot of different school codes. The course codes are the same and the course number is the same. So all language arts are coded this number in Alberta. And the school mark is on there, the number of credits, and then the diploma exam mark is on there too. And whether the H designates whether it's an honors course. So if your child gets over 80 as a mark, it's an honors course. This is pretty well universally accepted everywhere. <clears throat> so you can home educate, Keep on a parent-directed home education program, um, but there's only a few schools that support this. This is called Section 6 in the Home Education Regulations, where schools can report marks and credits for courses that the kids have mostly met the Alberta Programs of Study outcomes for. Okay. Um, and it's growing. I think there's about 13 boards now that will do this. This is what we did. Um, my kids would self-study language arts 30-1. They would put together a portfolio of what they did. The school looked at it and thought, yep, yeah, okay, that justifies an 83% mark. They report it to the government. The kids write the diploma exams. They're out of there, right? They can do it in two months if they're motivated, or they can take three years to do it if they're not motivated. So. Every little bit helps. Third way in is diploma or SAT, ACT um, exams. So they can write the exams and those tend to be pretty universally accepted across Canada. So it's, it's not what kids can show the work they've done. It's if they can prove that they're at a certain level of qualifications that they know the work. Number four is to do a high school course challenge. So a lot of school boards like CBE, Edmonton Public have a prescribed course challenge that kids have to jump through. But to me, when I look at the course challenges, there is much work as actually just doing the course. <laughs> it's, it's so many hoops to jump through. I'm like, oh, just do the course and just write the diploma exam, just study and write the diploma exam. And, and um, if you're over age 19, the diploma exam stands for 100% of the, the course mark. A lot of unschooled kids just do the grade 12 courses and exams. The problem with this is they have to wait till they're 19 to do this because if they're 18, they're not allowed to just write the exams. They have to have a course mark. Alberta Homeschooling Association is battling the government that this is not appropriate. If kids can quit school at 16, they should be able to write the exam and get out of there at 16 and have that exam count for their entire school final mark. But if, they're, if, if this doesn't happen, they have to wait till 19 to do this. Okay, so number six is do all the high school cores, but none of the filler courses. So we, I call the filler courses the things like phys ed, um, career and life management, any of the CTS courses. You know, uh, the universities and colleges and tech schools don't care about those. They don't care. They only want to see core courses like English, social, math, science, and maybe an option. So fast way to do that is just do the high school course and don't worry about a diploma. So that's these things. These are the cores. Next, you can get the um, GED, which is a um, that gives a lot of credit for life learning. 
Um, but I don't know if you're going to go through again, it's a lot of loopholes and a lot of work. If you're going to go through all those loopholes to get or hoops to get the GED, why not just write your 12 diploma exams and get out of there? Um, it can be stigmatized too. Um, for example, this might not cut it in getting into those competitive programs. You kids can always do adult high school upgrading at an adult school. And um, the benefits of that is that they do combine courses. So for example, my son, he um, graduated high school with no math or science. He had a diploma. Um, he got the minimum requirements in social studies and English and CTS. And then he decides he wants to go in a STEM career. Well, <laughs> guess what? He needs chemistry, biology, mathematics. And he did it all in a year and a half because he they combine courses. So they combine chemistry 2030 into one course. So adult students can, can get through it really fast. The other benefit of this is that um, they assume the students are adults. So they get to do real live, really cool science experiments because there's no liability issue about putting them in schools with kids. So that's kind of fun too. Number nine is community colleges. Now this is a very, very popular way unschoolers go on to university. They do a year at a community college. Athabasca University takes anyone 16 years of age and over. Now they don't have a whole lot of science um, courses or programs, but they do have a lot of arts and humanities. And when a child transfers, let's say that child goes from Athabasca to engineering, a lot of what they've taken in that first year can transfer into their degree program as options because in Canada, a four year degree is four years. It contains a lot of options because they want well-rounded students. Whereas in England, if you do four years at university, you can come out with a master's degree because their bachelor's is only three years because they don't make their kids do all the, the options. So it's kind of nice. So nothing's wasted. Whatever your child does at a community college can transfer over. So if they're ready, they can go on, do a year, get good marks, decide what they like, what they don't like, and then transfer to any other post-secondary institution as a transfer student. And um, if they have 10 full courses in college, the incoming receiving university will only look at their college marks. They won't even look at their high school marks. Um, if they have less than 10 half courses, they will require the high school transcript and the college transcript. Okay, number 10, challenge university entrance exams. So this depends on the university. Um, a lot of universities have these across Canada because a lot of provinces do not have so, so um, they want a level playing field of their incoming students. So my son wrote these in Memorial University. He had to, we, the day after we got off the plane, <laughs> jet lagged, he had to go and write a math entrance exam that was timed. And if any student got under 75%, the computer automatically deleted them out of all their first year math and science courses, put them in the remedial courses. Well, it was up to them to register for the remedial courses. So that was a high stakes exam, believe me. Um, so a lot of universities have those and a lot of kids can challenge them. Hopefully they won't have jet lag, but they'll do well in them and just gain their entrance that way. Number 11 is universities open studies programs. So this is a way to kind of look at the buffet and say, hmm, I want to take a psychology course or I want to take an economics course. And they can take that and they don't, it doesn't work towards a degree program or anything. But again, it is transferable. So it's not a waste. It's a good way to get kids, get their feet wet decide what they like, get the feel of university or colleges, and, um, and it's a low investment. 
program, but it, it's good. And usually there's a lot more openings in open studies and degree programs. Number 12, university in-house upgrading. So say the 17 year old gets up from your basement and wants to be a doctor and go into a science program. They could actually at 18, take in-house upgrading at universities. The upside is they feel like a university student already. They get the vibe of the campus. The downside is they cost more money. So they cost the same as other university courses. So you, they're paying or you're paying $600 a course, whereas they could still qualify for funded high school in an adult upgrading high school facility, which would be $60 a course, but actually right now is free in Alberta. So, so it is one way to get it, or maybe they're missing like Math 31 or missing a math course, they can still pick that up at university and um, start their university program right away. So that's a good thing. And there's mature student status. So a lot of unschoolers get in that way. So um, that usually starts over age 21. So like I said, in, in many programs, they reserve a certain number of seats for mature students who do not have a high school diploma, do not have prerequisite courses, but they're mature. They have life experience and lots of knowledge that way. And they get them in under that, um, that age group. So um, that's one way to get in too, if you want to wait, <laughs> your kids want to wait. And the last way is they can go to a regular high school. Um, they can unschool till grade nine and then switch to a regular high school or a regular online high school program and go the conventional way to get marks and credits and jump through all the hoops. That's one. Okay, I just want to address a little common concerns and then we'll go to our questions. Um, work ethic. People worry that if your kids have not got up before noon and suddenly they're 18 and they're doing this course, are they going to get up before noon? Of course they're going to get up before noon. Um, kids adapt when the need is there and when they want to do something, you don't have to force them. They, they lead. They want to do it. Will there be gaps in their knowledge? Yes, but there's gaps in everybody's knowledge. Um, even kids who go to school have gaps in their knowledge because ki ki or teachers in schools can't teach everything. So <laughs> yes, there will be gaps, but that's okay. Um, some tips, things, I'll tell you my learning curve with four kids in university and what I wished I had known back then as an unschooler with kids applying to a more formal education. Um, most application deadline is February 1st or March 1st. So that comes up really quick. Although early admission can be October of the previous year. That's not a guarantee your child's in. <laughs> it still depends on their final course marks, which they can't put in their applications until they get them, which is end of June or end of January. I would suggest apply to three to five schools at least because if they only apply to schools, two schools and they don't get in, they've wasted a whole year. Then they have to wait till the next February to apply again. Um, yes, you're paying all those application fees. It's money, but it's the way it's played. <laughs> um, make sure you pay fees on time, application fees, those kinds of things. You should hear, if your child applies by February or March, they should hear by May or June um, if they're conditionally accepted and definitely accepted by July, August, once they post their final course marks. And nice thick envelopes are good news. Thin little envelopes means they're not accepted, usually bad news. Um, the biggest takeaway I thought is your kid has to be ready to embrace the school experience before applying. If they're not wanting to go or you want them to go more than they want to go, you are wasting your money. You're wasting their time. They're wasting their time and your money. And it can actually hurt them because if they do bad, um, 
those marks aren't going to go away. <laughs> so if your child's not ready to go and they're going only for you and by Christmas, that's when a lot of kids drop out. By Christmas, their marks are D's. They cannot get rid of those D's. Those D's will be on their transcript at post-secondaries for the next 10 courses they take. It's not like high school where you can replace a mark, a bad mark. It's cumulative. So, and then if they're in um, an open studies program or they're in a transfer program, they will not get into the transfer program with bad marks. They have just shot themselves in the foot. So if they're not ready, put it off. Do not even apply. Wait till they're ready and willing to put in the effort. That was my biggest takeaway. I could tell you stories about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so in Alberta, this is Apply Alberta. So when your child finishes a course, say they took... Um, food studies, biology, chemistry, English language arts, through home education. They've done the work. They've um, shown their work to your homeschooling board. Your board says, yep, I agree with your marks of 85%. And the homeschooling board now reports this to the government. This comes out on the transcript. The child gets a copy of the transcript. And then if they're ready to go on to post-secondary, they fill out an application profile at Apply Alberta. And they list all the courses they've taken from the transcript. They put the marks and the credits they got and what date. And this is what post-secondary institutions pull from in Alberta. They do one profile, all the institutions pull from this, which is kind of nice. You're, they're not inputting this under every application. For out of town post secondaries, they will request the transcript to be sent. They don't pull from Apply Alberta. Okay, and this is what it looks like. So, here at this point, um, my child put in Biology 30, the course status. So, you have to apply in February. So, obviously, it's not completed. So, we'll say incomplete. And then they have to put a guest mark. So <laughs> we put our guest marks in there. Um, and then the course completion date. So it's uh, the onus on the student to come back and then change the course to completed and the final course mark. So by the end of June, those marks should all be complete, complete, complete. As here, you wouldn't have anything in progress unless the course was still in progress. So this is all complete. And that's what the post-secondary makes their final decisions on is what is the competitive average of these five courses. Okay, and they pull the transcript. This is kind of neat. Um, this was the U of C, and it actually said here, it was looking to see if kids were from the IB program, or if they were doing advanced placement programs, or if they did a self-study program, homeschooling, but didn't do distance ed or correspondence. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of neat that they wanted to see how self-directed kids were. I think that's a good thing. And if kids are applying to out of province, I'm just going to say, um, if you're applying to for applications to out of province schools, apply for residence at the same time. Because if you wait until acceptance comes, a lot of the residence is taken. So yeah, <laughs> uh, get the smallest food plan possible because kids are going to eat other places. Um, make sure if you can get them a bedroom with a door rather than shared accommodation because kids like to party. <laughs> now for scholarships, um, in Alberta, everyone, every child with an average over 75% can get the Alexander Rutherford scholarships. Now this doesn't apply for kids who just go for the grade 12 courses and marks. Well, they'll get the grade 12 scholarships, but not the grade 10s and 11s. And it's kind of a, that's kind of a thing. So if your child is bypassing the whole school system from grades one to 12, so they're home educating grade one to 12, and then they go into 12, write the diploma exams, get the grade 12 marks, they'll get the scholarship for grade 12, but not 10 and 11. 
there's lots of loans and grants out there, um, especially for um, low income. So it's almost better to apply later. So if your child's 18 to 22, they're considered dependent, whether they live at home or not, they're dependent. So there's no grants for that. But as soon as they turn age 22, whether they're still living at home or not, they get low income grants for being adult students and not earning income and going to school. So that's kind of good. It's up to about $3,000 a year. They can apply anytime during the year. And the guaranteed ones are a lot easier to apply for than the, the kind of, you know, <laughs> other ones. First year tips, I would suggest first year, um, get your child to know academic advising. That's their new best friend. They should really know the drop dates because like I said, marks are cumulative. So if they fail one course, they can't get rid of that failure for another 10 courses. If you wanna help them out, be sure to fill out third-party authorization forms to help them with financing, loans, registrations, all that. They need support that first year and the universities won't talk to you, even though you're a parent, they don't talk to you. I paid the wrong university once and <laughs> it took me three months to get my money back because they only talked to my child rather than me, even though I wrote the check. So just, just saying they do need that. Help your kids set up an organization system and keep monitoring them through the year. They need that support. If you have a child with special needs, I would suggest getting documentation for grade 12. So getting us a new psych ed assessment because university post-secondaries want them within three years. So getting it for grade 12 for the diploma exams or the final exams, they get accommodations. They also get accommodations in that. Uh, first, second, third, fourth year of, of post-secondaries. Every post-secondary has an accessibilities office that helps your child fill out grant forms, get um, special tutoring, learning strategists, and the resources they need to help them in their learning styles. So there's grant funding for technology, supports, and living costs too. A lot more way different than grades one to 12, where if you have a child with special needs, that none of the funding goes to your child. In post-secondary, it all goes to your child. Yay, well, that's great. Um, what is post-secondary like? It's a lot less work than high school. So I worried about my unschoolers because they, in high school, they took one or two core courses at a time. And then I thought, bam, they're gonna be hit with five courses a semester in post-secondary. How are they gonna juggle all that? But unlike high school that has you know, 46 assignments, most courses in post-secondary only have three to four major assignments. So it was actually a lot less work, they said, except for engineering, that was a lot of work. <laughs> um, the exams, those are high stakes. They're worth from 50 to 90% because they're trying to combat cheating in post-secondary. So um, when we whine about diploma exams worth 50%, Exams in post-secondary are worth a lot more. And the one regret I had was that my kids didn't know how to handwrite. They were online all their lives. So in most of their classes, even in the humanities, they weren't allowed computers. So it was a real handicap um, for them to take notes and to write timed exams. They learned how to handwrite. Like every typical unschooler, when the need arises, then they do it. <laughs> they did crash courses in handwriting. And in about two months, it looked good, really good. So I'm gonna wrap this up, but that um, there's no shortcuts. I mean, kids need to have the competencies to be successful in post-secondary and you wanna set them up for success. So you wanna make sure they know the content, can apply it and that they can do well. They, you're not shortcutting their way you're shortcutting a lot of the admin and the, the hoop jumping pretty well. And like I said, kids need parent support the first year. Okay, so um, now I would love to open it up to questions. Um, whatever, if you have to go, that's great. You have to go. <laughs> Feel free to email me I'm or reach me somewhere. I have a really 
good blog and you can find me anywhere on Facebook or wherever. So um, are we gonna, Monica, are we gonna like just unmute people or chat? Or? I think they can unmute themselves. Okay, I will start with the chat questions. So um, one question says, so there's no direct way to university from unschooling they still need to do high school courses like everyone else, but in a modified, more flexible way. Um, I would say in competitive, competitive programs, yes, there's no getting away from doing, from presenting credentials in chemistry, math, biology, sciences, because they are so competitive. I know you often hear people say, well, um, Universities are screaming to have homeschooled children. And yes, they are, but mostly in humanities and arts, those less competitive programs. In things like engineering, midwifery, um, science programs, they have so many applicants, they do not need to look at portfolios. And, and one thing I didn't say is that most of post-secondary programs are applied online. They don't care how much community service your child's done, volunteer work, what a nice person they are. Leadership programs don't care about any of that. They only have fields for five grade 12 courses. That's it. You apply online like everyone else. They don't even know what you look like. So it's kind of sad, but that's the way it is right now. Um, Stephanie says the University of Ottawa will allow young people to do three, two or three Head Start courses at a much reduced cost that can be used to apply into degree programs. Yeah, that's great. That is so awesome that um, the University of Ottawa does that. That's really good. Um, okay, anyone else? Oops, there's uh, no. I have a question, Judy. It's Jenny. Hi. Can you hear? Hi. Um, geez, you just you know so much. Um, so how, <laughs> like, did did you teach yourself all of this as you were kind of working through it with your kids? Like, I'm in Ontario, and I just don't know how much of it is applicable for Ontario. Um, but I would imagine it's probably not far off, and I guess when I, you know, if I do get there, it would be just kind of like a learning journey for us to try to figure out what the kids would need, right? Well, you can go on there, any, um, any major universities, websites and colleges too, and look and see what the requirements are for, um, they have requirements for 18 year olds coming from high school. They have requirements for mature students um, for international students. So you can go and kind of see what, what they would require. Um, this was my learnings. I had kids apply to um, U of Vic, UBC, U of Alberta, U of C, Royal, U of Saskatchewan, um, Simon Fraser, Memorial, and Dalhousie. So um, this was a lot of my, our experiences and a lot of learnings that we found out that <laughs> a lot of uh, sweat and tears too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Judy, for sharing this with us. But I outline all this in my book too, but um, yeah. Okay. I don't think a lot yeah. has changed in the last 10, 20, 30 years since when I went to school other than the competitive averages is so much higher. I, I posted in our local group, the competitive averages in 1999 for programs at University of Calgary, and then what they are this year, and grade inflation has just moved everything up. Yeah. So, wow. Well, that's probably the only thing changed. <laughs> um, Okay, Melinda says, what if they never want to go to high school at all, or if learning differences make it so that it takes them five times much time to complete the required study at home? 
you know what? Education is a journey. It's not a race. So if it takes some more time to get to a point where they really, really are motivated to want to do things, it's time well spent. It's um, nobody does well when they go to university at 18 years of age. It's not a rush. Um, and if they never want to go to high school, that's okay too. They're, all they need to do is figure out what they want to do and go for it. Because if they're motivated, then they're going to have to do some of the stuff they don't want to do, but they're going to do a lot of the stuff they want to do to get into that program. So um, I guess what I'm saying is it's not going to be us that wants them to go. They have to want to go. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> There's a question from Aura Pond says, apologies if you said this already, do you foresee any changes in the past to university over the next 10 to 15 years, especially as homeschooling is becoming more popular? Um, yeah, I think the universities used to be really, big changes are online courses now. Um, the universities used to be really anti-online because they want kids in seats. They want them to do, they want to charge for campus rec and <laughs> all that other stuff. Um, so I think there, because of COVID, there's gonna be a lot more online offerings and the quality of teaching will increase in online now because p kids are saying, well, why am I paying $5,000 a year for an course where I don't even see my instructor over Zoom or I can't, understand my instructor over Zoom. So I think the quality is going to get a lot better. Um, better courses, more courses. Um, what I also see too is not so much what courses kids take, but what they can do with those courses, what skills, what skills they have. So more testing qualifications other than courses. So um, if you look at Google now, Google, has put out a I think, 16th university course, right? To give kids the skills they need so who can hire them? But it's not all too. I'm seeing more of that. I'm seeing more um, courses on the internet from anywhere. And, but I do see there's still a feature of doing qualifications. And then I want my hot to reach a certain standard of skill and confidence. I want my child's brain surgeon to have a certain level of qualifications. Um, you need that, but how do you get there? It's really going to become very wide open and not contained in our schools and not contained in just university programs. I think where people find what they learn is going to be all over the place. Um, he says, what did you say this year in Alberta? Oh, yeah. So, all children in Alberta are funded to age 20. So, if your child's birthday is September 4th, or 20th, or 4th, they can take a whole year's of courses um, as of September 1st to get that funded. So, um, it used to be extended a course, but now it's free. So they can upgrade until age 20. So I would really have a conversation with your 20 year old child and say, if you want to go somewhere and you want to get great confidentials and get a course, now's the year to do it because it's free. Next year, you can just self study and write the exam, which is, you know, $26. That's okay. Um, but this year, if you want the course, it's a lot cheaper. All right, any more questions? You can feel free to just unmute yourself or definitely type it into the chat box. Judy, I have a question. Um, if a child chooses to not do any um, like traditional or formal learning, uh, until until they feel ready in, in high school or at whatever point. Um, so 
you know, not opening a single math study book or anything like that, not taking any classes or showing any interest, you know, let's just say, um, do you feel like, are they missing out on any aspect where if they were exposed to some of that stuff, they might, um, they might know what they're interested in? You know, they might have more opportunity to know what they're interested in. Maybe I would say, I would say kids get exposed to that though through a lot of other venues and traditional courses. Um, so how will your, your unschooled kids know they love poetry if they're never exposed to poetry? And I say, well, they are exposed to poetry. Maybe they don't read a formal English course, but they hear song, they, you know, come across poetry in other ways. So I, I don't think kids are missing out if they don't take formal courses of what they learn. I would suggest they learn more because they're out in the community seeing people in different jobs, right? And seeing, and, you know, getting your kid to ask the dishwasher repair guy, what, what did you do to become a dishwasher repair? Or um, the dentist, what did you have to do to become a dentist? Those are things your kids need to know is um, what they'd have to do to to what qualifications to go on to if that's what they're passionate about. But oh, I, I think kids learn about all different kinds of career paths through, through you know, going to the day land school of life. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Really um, Shazia, you were saying, I mentioned about Google that they're doing a, um, a really, University for about six to eight months, where they just concentrate on training um, for Google Jobs and their entire and things like that. I mean, they're they're going to make more money. They they don't have to have a four year, well rounded degree where they're taking options that they are used. By the time kids get to post-secondary, they should know what they want to do. They don't need these options to discover more stuff. So um, I think that's the future is more skills-based um, kind of programs and condensed. Because if, if kids are only training for their next five-year career, they don't want to spend a lot of time in education. They want to um, upgrade, go on to that. Maybe that's not going to fit. Maybe they want to upgrade somewhere here and go on to that. That's what our working life is now. We don't work 30 years for a company in the same job. We change. We really do change. I was just going to jump in and say that um, I'm in Quebec. And I have an 18-year-old and we're kind of in the process of this right now. So he's he pretty much unschooled. He did you know some courses by um, just following them himself or having a mentor for high school, grade nine, 10, 11 math, things like that. And then he decided to go to high school for grade 12. And we actually prepared the night before we went in to register him. We prepared a homeschool transcript because it suddenly yeah. seemed like we should walk in with a something. And so we did it and we just, quickly contacted a couple of his mentors or tutors and asked them to write a paragraph about him. So he had like maybe three pages that listed kind of things he'd done. Like we made it look a bit schooly, but stuff that was just in the community, we put that in there as well, volunteering, like we just put it all in. And then we put these few paragraphs that kind of talked about him as a learner and as a person. And when we got to the school, the vice principal kind of looked at this, looked at him and went, um, I don't know, like she just didn't know whether to admit him or not into grade 12. We went to the guidance counselor who said, give me a few minutes, took a look through it in detail, came out and said, this is amazing. Without this, I would not have admitted him into grade 12 classes because I wouldn't have known that he was gonna be okay. But seeing this, I know that he's gonna be okay. And he was, he got you know 87 average or whatever. So he's now taking a gap year and is in the process of applying to universities, you know, kind of figuring out which universities he wants to go to. So he's applied to bishops in Quebec already mm -hmm. and been accepted into what they thought was his first choice, 
which actually wasn't, it was, they did it alphabetically or something, I don't know. So he's already been accepted based on just the, the grade 12 marks that he submitted to them. But now it's interesting because he's talking to Carleton University, which is in Ottawa. And what he started doing is calling the admissions office directly. And this particular person that he hit upon at Carleton said, well, send me your marks and send me a version of that transcript you talked about that you did for grade 12. And so he kind of updated it, sent it to them. And they said, this is awesome. Like seeing this really helps me to see you more holistically. And so if you can, when you submit your application, can you make sure it comes across my desk as well? Because I'm going to keep an eye on your application. It looks really good. So, which was really interesting because as soon as you have those grade 12 marks, you're kind of in Ontario, you're forced into that filling out the standard forms, which don't, we're just kind of still figuring out how you fill those out as a homeschooler who also has some credits, you're kind of in between the cracks a little bit. But it was just really interesting to see that this one person wanted, like said, I have time, I can read it. And having read it, keep me in the loop because I'm going to help it as part of your application. So it's just wanted to share that and be curious to hear like he's, he's now trying to get in touch with UBC and UVic and, you know, trying to like find who's the nice, friendly homeschool warm person in those departments that he can have that same kind of connection with and see where that takes him. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's super. That he, um, and he must have been pretty confident during the interview too. Like they, did they grill him a lot or? No, it wasn't. I mean, he was really calling just for information. It just, yeah. he, like, cause he actually called UBC with a similar type of call mm -hmm. and hit somebody who just like put up a wall. Yeah. Like, he said, you don't have grade 12 English because he didn't wind up taking grade 12 English. You don't have grade 12 English, like forget it. Like it was just like doors closed. Mm -hmm. And so now he's, you know, we're, we just actually posted in the, the BC, one of the BC homeschooler Facebook groups, like, okay, who's the friendly person at UBC? Like who's the person who's going to go beyond the, you know, what the typical rule is. So I don't know if we're going to get anywhere, but that's the idea. And somebody was just asking what course he's applying for. He's applying for engineering and computer engineering. Awesome. So we'll see. I mean, who knows where this is actually going? We'll know in, I guess, six months. But so far, yeah. he, he's definitely learning a lot in the process. And he's totally taking responsibility for it. It's interesting yeah. what you're saying about they shouldn't do it till they're ready. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so in Alberta, um, at age 19, a child can take any grade 12 course without any prerequisites, guaranteed. They do not have to um, beg or explain themselves. They have, to, they have that ability. They can just do it. Um, and if they don't want to do that, they can just write the diploma exam. And the diploma exam will count for 100% of their course mark, right? Um, if they're under age 19, they write the diploma exam, but the transcript gets the best of the combined course exam mark. Yeah, yeah, kind of thing. So, so anyone in Alberta can just not care about school until age 19. <laughs> and then either take the course for a year where it's still funded or write the exam. And then they're, they're yeah, can apply anywhere. And um, I found like the keys, those keys, I don't have a book to show you right here, but the keys are great because they cover all the concepts on the exam. Um, they're standalone courses, bio, English, social. Any child can take those courses without taking prerequisites. They do not need grades one to 11 of biology, grades one to 11 of English, grades one to 11 of social. It's only on that course and that set of concepts, which is kind of nice, right? Math tends to build and the sciences tend to build. So um, for example, my son's 18. So he's taking, there's, he's taking a combined course in grade 10, which is um, math 15, math and C. And the math 15 is always grade one to grade 10 it catches them up or just fills in gaps or whatever. And then they take the math 10 and then they go to high school or 10, 11, 12, if they're going. But I know some kids are just math 30 and because of a lot of study, they, they do okay, which is math 30. I just wanted to point out 
that the keys, there's an online app type of version of the keys that's totally free for, through the Calgary Public Library. So for mm -hmm. our, for us in Calgary, there might be similar versions in various other uh, provinces. Mm -hmm. And if not, there's definitely a paid version of it. <laughs> and uh, I think it's pretty, it's pretty great in that. In fact, I think it goes, it's not just high school, it's definitely junior high school material. It covers all the, the main courses and it might even be a elementary curriculum as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. You don't even have to buy a curriculum book anymore if you live yeah. in Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> or Alberta. <laughs> or Alberta, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know if they have it in Edmonton, but yeah. Just get a Calgary Public Library card. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Are there any more questions? If not, I'll just close it up. And. Uh, oh, I think there was one more in the chat box. Let me just check. Oh, okay, right. Okay, questions, questions, calling questions. Three, two, one. No questions. <laughs> all right. I just wanted to let you all know um, if you enjoyed this session, there is going to be more sessions. It's going to be monthly. The Chinook Three Learners is uh, sponsoring these monthly webinars on, on um, different topics in education, homeschooling, unschooling. Uh, next month, January. Normally, I don't think there's too many webinars and stuff in January, as especially the first week. But I thought with with COVID, we have opportunities to uh, <laughs> to zoom in to people stuck at home. So for January, Gordon Hamilton will be speaking about math. And Gordon Hamilton, if you don't know him, is a Canadian mathematician and puzzle designer. He actually created the game called Santorini. It's out in uh, game stores everywhere. Pretty cool. And, Is he um, Math Pickle? Yeah, he's the guy who started Math Pickle in 2010. And now it's even a bigger, better site with a few other collaborators um, in on the, on the, uh, the web uh, site. Um, he says that he, he founded Math Pickle in 2010 to inject unsolved problems into classrooms. There is nothing he enjoys more than stumping students and having them stump him. <laughs> so in January, either the first Wednesday, um, I was thinking the first Wednesday, since most people will still be on vacation with nowhere to go, <laughs> probably. Um, and he will be talking about math and how playing with math can help your kids love math and how to, how to play with math with your kids. And so that's January's uh, offering. He, he, did, he did a homeschool class one year. Um, there were eight kids and my son was one of them for grade nine math. And the whole year he, just did it. he taught through puzzles and games. It was amazing. And you know, if, if you, any of your kids or not, maybe not even your kids, if you're interested, you can, He's running some free like noon noon hour uh, math, um, playing with math uh, sessions, which are totally free. I will have to dig it up, uh, the link and send it all to you. If you're interested in this or um, the further um, webinars through Chinook Free Learners, like stick your email in the chat box and I'll send you the information. But he has this one hour session every single day until the end of the year uh, where he does math with kids. He plays math with kids and it's free. Cool. And I think Monica that um, past puzzles, they're all on his website. Yes, there, he has puzzles on his website, but these uh, his um, sessions are of course interactive, right? And there's a lot of chatting going on and, you know, just being personable as well as doing these fun math things.
So thank you everyone for coming and thank you for those who stayed all the way to the end. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thank and you. if you have any more thank questions, you. feel free to email me. <laughs> yes, you can find Judy at uh, professionalparenting.ca. That's professionalparenting.ca.